Test, test, test. One, two, three. Is this coming through loud and clear? Let us see. Let us see. Hey there, how's it going? It is your muscle building coach, Lee Hayward, with the Total Fitness Bodybuilding video chat for Friday, December the 6th. Hopefully this is coming through loud and clear. Uh, I was a couple minutes late getting started with the uh, video chat today. <clears throat> On Fridays, uh, our, my son Harvey is at daycare, so we were picking him up, and we were a few minutes late picking him up at daycare. So uh, that's the reason why I was a little bit later than normal. But, hey, I'll make up for it. We'll go a little bit later to uh, still have an hour-long video chat. So for those of you who are tuned in right now, if you can hear me, if you can see me, if this is coming through loud and clear, please let me know in the chat window. Uh, I'd like to know. Just make sure that I'm not talking to dead air out there. And if you could do that for me, just say it's coming through loud and clear. You can hear me. You can see me. I'm waving my arms, all that good stuff. If it's coming through, let me know. Loud and clear. Thank you, Andrew. We've got Brandon joining. Andrew's joining. If this is your first time tuning into a live video chat like this, I want to welcome you. It's always nice to have new people. And if you're a regular returning again for another week of Q&A and chit chat and all that good stuff, then welcome back. And the way these video chats work is I'm going to be hanging out here over the next hour and answering any questions and topics of discussion that you have with regards to fitness, nutrition, building muscle, losing body fat, and getting yourself back in shape. So anything that you would like to discuss, feel free to post that in our video chat window, and I'll do the best that I can to help you out over the course of our video chat today. Uh, just to give you a a couple little updates with my own training. For those of you who are regulars, you realize that a few weeks ago, I actually had uh, suffered an injury in the gym. I tore a tricep, my left tricep. I ended up tearing it, uh, but it's on the mend. Thankfully, it was only muscle fiber tear. It wasn't a full tendon or ligament detachment, so it, it's healing up pretty well. Like I was actually in the gym today training, now, of course, when I say training, it's it's rehab work, like very lightweight, but I have full mobility. Like I can move my arm, you know, lift it all the way up, move it around. It, it doesn't really bother me. Like I can feel it. It kind of feels like sore, almost like if you really had a hard workout and it always feels that kind of soreness, but I can't lift much weight. Like when I'm doing exercises, I'm, I'm using baby weights, literally. Like I was doing uh, some tricep work with like 20 pounds on the weight stack, shoulder presses with 20 pounds, pull downs with, with 20 pounds, like whatever the, the smallest weight on, on the machine, that's what I'm doing exercises with and just doing high repetitions and going through the motions. And the main thing at this stage is just to keep that muscle active, to keep movement and blood flow and circulation there and to prevent scar tissue from building up. And I think that's why it's it's recovering and healing up as well as it is, is because I'm doing a little bit of exercise every single day, even if it's just some mobility work at home, like some arm circles and different uh, mobility exercises, kind of stuff that I would do if I was warming up prior to a workout. I'm doing that on a daily basis. And that frequent activity, that frequent movement is what's helping to aid with the recovery of my uh, torn tricep. It did bruise a little bit, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't major. It wasn't like I've, I've suffered much worse injuries in the past. And I think this one should heal up quite nicely. So hopefully by the time the new year rolls around, I should be back into normal training once again. And that's, that's my goal. So, uh, you know, I, I'm quite fortunate that it was only a minor injury and not a, a major one, not a major setback. Now, in the meantime, like I've been still keeping on track with my nutrition keeping on track with cardio. In fact, I probably even bumped up the cardio sense because I know I'm not burning calories uh, through weight training as much as I normally do. So I want to make up for that through some extra cardio, make sure that I don't gain fat in the process because you know I I'm on a good roll now and I want to keep that momentum going, right? I don't want to let myself get fat and out of shape because I've gotten an injury. You know, like a lot of people use excuses to let themselves go. Like, oh, I I'm, I'm, injured or I'm busy or the holidays are coming up or, or whatever. Like there's always going to be something coming up, right? We, life is always throwing challenges your way. Like very few people have everything perfect where there's no challenges, no obstacles, nothing to deal with. And you just, oh, I have nothing better to do than to go to the gym and work out every day 
and I have all the time in the world to prepare my meals and everything's just great. Like, I don't know anybody who's in that situation. Like, most people are busy, right? You've got a family, you've got your career, you, you've got responsibilities, right? You've got challenges. It's like, stuff is always going to come up. Like, it's people always say, well, when I'm not busy, or when I get this done, or when I get that done, or, or when I have more time. Like, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to just make the best of your situation right now and deal with it, right? That's, that's the reality of it. And if you can master that, like, just make the best of your situation and deal with the challenges as they come and still move forward, that's the key to making this a lifestyle and and having that long-term success rather than the whole on and off, yo-yo, up and down, you know, putting your program on pause and thinking, oh, I'll resume it again later on. Whatever progress you make while you're on, you're going to lose while you're off. So this whole on and off again mentality, it's, it's literally a waste of time, right? I mean, I've seen so many people have that type of mentality and, and ultimately, even though they've probably been working out on and off for years, they're still in the beginner phase. They still look like a beginner. Their body is still at that beginner phase, even though they've been doing it a long time. Because, you know, let's just say you, you work out consistently for six weeks and then you get busy, you get sidetracked, and then you take several weeks off. And then you say, oh, okay, well, I'll get back on and I'll start working out again. Well, you're always just restarting. You're, you know, it's, you're never making any progress. It's like one step forward, one step back, one step forward, one step back. Like you don't make any progress that way. You're just always spinning your wheels going nowhere. Whereas if you can just keep moving forward, even if it's just a small bit, like if you can commit to a small, simple program, a simple nutrition plan, but it's just slow, steady progress moving in the right direction, that's much better than this whole extreme all or nothing approach, right? Like, I actually was talking to some of my coaching students. We have a, a private coaching group and uh, I was sharing it. Like a lot of times when people have the, the all or nothing mentality, very rare do you get all, but more often than not, you will get nothing. So if you try and take that approach to your fitness, like all or nothing, I'm going to wait till everything's perfect before I start. You're never going to make any progress. You're always going to be just stuck in a rut, right? You have to make the best of whatever situation and whatever life throws at you. So. In my case, I mean, of course, I had the the injury, but that hasn't stopped me. I'm still pushing forward, you know, working within my limits, working within my pain threshold. But every single day I'm doing something, whether that's cardio, whether that's weight training. I mean, the meals, 80 to 90 percent of the time, they're on track. So, again, think of long term consistency over, you know, that's what's going to move you forward. It's none of this on and off extreme approach. So I just wanted to share that with you because I'm sure there's people probably wondering how things have been going with regards to that. All right, we've got some questions and people joining in, so let's just jump right to it. Got myself a bottle of water, fresh bottle. This one's empty. <laughs> Lots of bottles of water, or, or well, one empty bottle, one full bottle. So I'm gonna wet the whistle and we'll jump right in. Okie dokie. Again, Brandon is joining in. Andrew's joining in. Anthony is joining in. Fred is joining. John is joining. Ken, Frederick. Awesome, guys. Welcome. Uh, first question. Let's see. First off, I'm just curious. Where's everybody tuning in from? Like, type in. Let me know where you're from. Like, Anthony is joining us from London. I'm assuming that must be London in the UK because there are a few different Londons in the world, but I'm assuming it's London in the UK. So yeah, where are you tuning in from? Let me know. Type in the chat window. Let me know. We have Ken joining from the UK. All right, Fred's got a question. He's saying, what are your thoughts on strong lifts? Five by five by Mendy. Uh, That's a great strength and power program. Obviously, it's not a beginner's program. I mean, you have to have a decent level of, of strength, fitness, and and a good level of work capacity in order to do a five by five program with the, the barbell lifts like that. But if you are at that stage in your training, I think it's a great program. I've used numerous different five by five variations over the years. And every time I've followed them, I've made solid progress. Right? I'm a big fan of them. Uh, one that I've used numerous times and I've actually recommended it to some of my uh, coaching students is uh, the Bill Starr five by five program. That's probably where the whole five by five thing really became popular. And if you're not familiar with Bill Starr, he's like an old time uh, weightlifter, powerlifter, 
strength and conditioning coach. And he's one who really made the whole five by five famous. Now I know since then there's been numerous people on the internet come up with their own variations of five by five. And it, it's a great strength and mass building program, right? It's just definitely a good for that. Uh, John's joining us. <clears throat> he said, what are your thoughts about creatine monohydrate and cre-alkaline hydrochloride? Um, I, I'm a fan of creatine monohydrate. Like creatine monohydrate works. I, I take that personally. I've been using it for years. Like literally I've been taking creatine now since 1994 or somewhere around there is when I started using creatine and I'm still using it. Every single day I have one serving, which is approximately five grams of creatine monohydrate. And that's just a staple in my nutritional protocol. I mean, I take that every single day, just the same as I take my vitamins every single day. It's just a staple that I have there. And th the way it is with creatine, it, it's not this miracle supplement, right? But it is, it does work, right? I mean, hands down, it definitely does work. It'll help to give you uh, that. What it does is it provides the, uh, the ATP energy, adenosine triphosphate, which is the energy that's used for high intensity strength. So like weight training, any explosive training, uh, any type of explosive athletics, that's the type of energy that creatine gives you. And in addition to the strength and uh, energy benefits, there's a lot of health and mental and cognitive benefits. So it's, it's a good overall strength and health supplement. I mean, I'd recommend creatine to people even if you're not working out just for the overall health benefits of it. But as far as the crealkaline, I've tried the crealkaline myself. And personally, I don't think it's as good as the creatine monohydrate. I, I like the monohydrate. I keep using that over and over again. It works well for me. And, and it's on a cost basis. It's much more efficient, cost efficient, you know, as far as creatine is concerned. Like you can use creatine monohydrate for literally pennies a day. I mean, depending on, on where you live and, and how you buy it. Like I get the big thousand gram jugs of creatine. I mean, you can get them for like 30 bucks or something, somewhere in that range. So, I mean, when you look, you take five grams a day, you've got a thousand grams and it costs you 30 bucks. I mean, like, man, you, like it works out to literally pennies a serving to take creatine. So it's, it's one of the best bangs for your buck. And I mean, I just keep it in the supplement cupboard there. And every day when I take my vitamins, I just toss down a, a scoop of creatine as well. Uh, John's joining in and he says, what are your, th oh, sorry, that was John, sorry, I asked, um, Ken's joining us uh, from the UK and I'll read, we have First Revenge joining in, uh, did you have any goals in powerlifting back in the day? Yes, I trained in powerlifting, I competed in powerlifting back in the day, uh, my personal best lifts when I was involved with powerlifting, I did a 445 bench, a 5 15 squat and a 525 deadlift. That was my personal best numbers that I did. And those were all set around 2004, 2005, somewhere in that range. That's when I was, my main focus was, was on powerlifting back then. Uh, Frederick's asking, Lee, what is your best body part? Is it your back? You seem to have a lot of back build. Did you do a lot of deadlifts to build your back? How do you use the deadlift and your split? Any tips? Um, first off, there's a couple questions there. My best body part, I would probably say calves. Genetically, I've, I've got good calf development and I'm going to thank my mother for that. My mother has big calves and of course she doesn't even work out and she still has got big calves. Like the calves are one of those muscles. Like some people have them, some people don't. Fortunately, I was born with good calves. Now, of course I still train them and that makes a big difference as well. But, uh, that uh, genetically calves hands down like even if i don't focus on my calves they're still big right i mean if, if i had the same muscle development all throughout my body as i do in my calves like i would be a pro caliber bodybuilder hands down because like it's there's just so much muscle fibers there like even if i don't train calves they're still huge i mean i don't know what they measure now i haven't measured them in a while but i mean they've been you know, at my all time heaviest weight, they were probably pushing close, you know, 19, 20 inches, somewhere in that range, you know, back when I was bulked up. Uh, but even now, I mean, they're still probably around 18 inches. And like I say, I don't even, I, I do train them, but it's, it's not like I'm training them for mass. It's like maybe I'll do a few sets of calf raises, you know, 
a couple times a week. Like that's usually the extent of my calf training. But uh, I also find cardio, just doing regular cardio is great for the calves as well, especially if you're doing like cycling or, or the Stairmaster or, or anything along those lines, you know, that gets a lot of calf stimulation, but that's my best body part. Uh, back is another strong body part of mine. I used to do, I mean, as I mentioned, I'm a lot of deadlifting. Um, another one that I find is really good for the back is uh, pull-ups. Huge fan of pull-ups. If you can get strong at pull-ups, that's going to carry over and help you build a big back. Uh, the key to the back, I, I think, is really learning how to get that mind muscle activation. Because the, the trick with the back is you can't see it. Like if, if you're training your, your other body parts, you can see them while you're working, them, right? Like if you're training your arms, you can look down, you can see your arms. Or if you're looking in the mirror while you're doing an exercise, you can see it. Like, uh, for example, like if you're doing a chest, like you're doing flies or whatever, like you can look down, you can see your chest. Or if you're training in front of the mirror, you know, you can see it. And just seeing the muscles work and stretch and contract as you're doing an exercise helps to develop that mind muscle connection. But with the back, you can't see it. So again, out of sight, out of mind, right? So you really have to develop it and learn how to feel the muscles stretch and contract as you're doing your exercises. So if the back is a stubborn body part, one of the strategies that I recommend is lighten up the weight and really focus on your form and getting that feeling, you know, you take a moderate weight, like even something that you would use as like a warm up weight and make sure that you can actually feel the muscles contract and then stretch and really get that feeling. And once you have it where you can feel the muscles contracting and, and like when you do a, a, a row or anything like that, or a pull down or whatever, it, it should feel like the muscles are, are cramping and contracting, especially in that peak contracted position. And if you can't maintain that, then you need to focus on that. Get that down first before you worry about increasing the weight, right? Get the mind muscle connection activation going on there and then worry about increasing the weight while maintaining that same feeling. So that, that's critical when it comes to the back, right? And uh, one of the things I'm a big advocate of is doing a variety of exercises to work all the different ranges of motion. So you want to do exercises that are going to be the big uh, compound power moves, things like deadlifts and heavy rows, uh, you want to do exercises that are going to stretch out the lats, things such as like uh, pull downs, uh, pull overs, things that are going to stretch the muscles. And then you want to do some isolation work, some some more strict rowing variations, like maybe like a chest supported row or some uh, cable rows or whatever, where you can really get a good peak contraction and change it up. Like do hit the back from different angles. I'm a big advocate of that. I like to do overhand as well as underhand grip work when I'm training lats. When you do overhand and the elbows tend to flare out wide, that works more of the upper back area. When you use an underhand curl grip, obviously the elbows tuck down and that activates more of the lower lats. So including a combination of overhand rowing work and underhand rowing work, same with pull, pull downs or pull ups, overhand as well as underhand, it's going to hit all the aspects of your back to give you good complete development. All right, we have Anthony joining in. Uh, he says, I understand you struggled when you had Harvey. Well, I didn't have him. My wife had him, but I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, he says, do you have advice for first-time dads who, who have to work full-time, raise a new baby, lack sleep, lack energy, etc.? All right. I hear you, my friend. I hear you. And if you have a new baby at home, your sleep schedule is all over the place right? Like, especially in that first year, right? When the baby is, is waking up throughout the night and, you know, you're, you're changing diapers, you're getting bottles and, and, and just, you know, when they cry and you just got to go soothe them and stuff like that. I mean, like it, it's, you're not sleeping soundly through the night. So, I mean, obviously that's going to have a big impact on your recovery. It's going to have a big impact on your energy. So you, you really kind of just have to make the best of your situation, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's challenging. But the big thing that, that's going to help is, uh, first off, consistency with your nutrition, right? Have some sort of plan, game plan in place with your nutrition. And try and plan ahead because one of the biggest drawbacks, and this is something that I fell into as, as you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this, is I got lazy with my nutrition 
and I, I took the easy way out. So like I said, oh, I'm too lazy to cook. I'll, I'll just order a pizza or, you know, we'll, we'll just slap together something, you know, and I was, I was looking for the quick, easy foods, quick, easy foods. And unfortunately, quick, easy foods are usually not healthy foods. And I, I got into that bad habit of eating a lot of junk, a lot of snacks, a lot of just stuff that you can quickly grab on the run. And I, I kind of justified it by saying, oh, well, oh, you know, I'll just do it today. I'll get back on track tomorrow. And then, of course, tomorrow came and I'm like, I'll get back on track next week. And it just kept getting pushed further and further back. And it's not like I purposely tried to get fat and out of shape, but it's just all these little bad decisions in the moment started to stack up, right? Like we don't plan it. It's just our habits dictate our results. So, I mean, I made a bunch of bad habits, you know, and they stacked up. And then before I knew it, I'm looking in the mirror. I'm like, who's this fat slob looking back at me? Like, what the heck? I got a gut hanging over my belt. Like, what's on the go here? And then, of course, uh, when I'd be posting stuff, like making YouTube videos or, or whatever, like people were saying, like, who's this fat slob giving fitness advice? And I'm like, man, I got to get my, you know, SHIT together, right? I got to get something together. So that's when I really, over the last couple of years, said, you know, no more, right? I, I got to figure out a way to, to make this work. Right. And, and, and that's basically what I did. So in, in my situation right now, I work out three days a week, at, like in the gym, three days a week. So it, it's not very time consuming. Right. Like I mentioned earlier, I mean, you don't have to have the all or nothing approach. You just have to be doing enough consistently over the long term to move you in the right direction. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be good enough and good enough consistently. So for me, three weight training workouts a week. If I can't make it to the gym for a weight training workout, then I will do some body weight exercises at home. If you have some sort of home gym equipment, whether that's like dumbbells or resistance bands, then you can utilize that as well. But make sure that you're just getting some consistent exercise in there. Even if it's not optimal, as long as like anything is better than nothing, right? Even if it's for 20 minutes, like a 20 minute body weight circuit or like a 20 minute dumbbell routine or something like that, you know, is better than skipping a workout entirely. Same with the cardio, like on my off days from weight training, I like to do cardio. And, and actually in my case, I do cardio every single day, right? And it doesn't have to be high intensity cardio. It doesn't have to be anything grand, like take the dog for a walk. That's cardio. Uh, you know, I've got an elliptical machine downstairs and even throughout the day, like if I've got 10 minutes, I'll run down and do 10 minutes on the elliptical. Like it doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Like in the past, I used to have this, this mindset. Well, if I can't dedicate at least 45 minutes to cardio, what's the point? And when I had that mindset, very often, like say, if you have this all or nothing mindset, you rarely ever get all and you very often get nothing. So if I kept thinking to myself, oh, I don't have time to work out or I don't have time to do cardio, I don't have time. And I'd end up putting it off and I'd think, well, I'll do it when I have time. But it really doesn't take that much time. Like if you've got 10 minutes, like go for a 10 minute walk around the block, right? If you got 10 minutes, do some push-ups, do some body weight squats, just do whatever you can in the meantime. I mean, that is better than nothing. And that's what I did a lot of it. Like for me to make my my comeback or my my transformation from a fat dad bod to actually, you know, lean and healthy and, and, and comfortable with my physique, that's how I did it. I squeezed in little mini exercise sessions where I could, whether that was, you know, little bursts of cardio, like a walk around the block for 10 minutes, little body weight circuit routine, going to the gym, you know, three days a week, all the stuff adds up. And then of course, when it comes to the nutrition, it doesn't take any more time to eat healthy than it does to eat junk. And that was a big realization that I had to come to, you know, because once you get into the junk food habits, it's easy to give in to the junk food habits and to keep those negative habits going. But today we have, we've, we've got it so easy. Like you can eat quick, and healthy. And I made a YouTube video not too long ago showing this. Uh, it just goes just go back to my most recent videos on the YouTube channel. Um, I can't remember the, the exact title of the video now. Yeah, I'll just find it for you there real quick because if you want to go check it out. It's um come on, where's it to? It's where's it to? Where's it to? Quick and easy fat burning meals, quick and easy fat loss meals. It's, it's one of the most recent videos. If you go to my main YouTube channel there now, you'll see it. Um, but that in there, I, I share some of the strategies that I use right now 
have quick, simple meals on hand. And it's, it's like I say, we're spoiled these days because it's just as easy now to grab a healthy fat burning meal as it is to grab a fast food, junk food, fattening meal. So there's really no excuse, right? It's just you making better food choices. And all these little choices, the choice to do a little 10 minute workout if you have time versus no workout at all, the choice to have you know, a healthy meal versus a non-healthy meal. All those little in the moment decisions are what's going to shape whether or not you get in shape or whether you become a fat out of shape dad bod. So that's my advice is just to make the best of all every little opportunity you get. That's going to have a huge impact. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to focus on the progress. All right. Another question there. This one's from Anthony. Uh, okay, that's actually just a continuation on from the uh, the first one. All right, let's move on. Uh, Armani is joining us, and he says, "What do you think is the best approach for a six to ten rep range for hypertrophy going into a third block of hypertrophy push pull legs or upper lower?" All right, let me read that again. <laughs> what do you think is the best approach for six to ten reps range for hypertrophy going into a third block of hypertrophy push pull legs or upper? So I guess the question is push pull legs are upper or lower. Uh, honestly, it's whatever you <laughs> it depends on you. Like you can make both work, right? Push pull legs works, an upper lower body split works. It's what works best for your schedule. Now, if you've been doing one consistently and you like it and you want to keep doing it, then keep doing it, right? I mean like there's no perfect program. That's one thing you have to realize. Like you can make any program or any split work. Like th there's so much nonsense and, and debates over the best split, the best routine. The best program is the one that you follow. Like going back to the question I just answered, like even if you just have time for little mini workouts, but you do them consistently, that's better than the best planned, most compl complex hypertrophy training split that you don't follow consistently. Like it, consistency is the key. It's not the, the plan. It's it's not all the different variables and stuff like that. I mean, now if you're an advanced athlete and like you've got every, like you got all your ducks in a row, right? I mean, you, your training is nailed down like 100% consistency. Your nutrition is nailed down perfect, right? Your sleep is optimal. Your lifestyle habits are, are in line. Like you're, every, you have everything lined up for you. Then you know, you can work on the, the variables of, okay, what's the best set and rep pattern? What's the best split? You know, how am I going to optimize this based on your goals? But for most people, and like I'm talking about like people that I've been coaching, they're, they don't need the most optimal training split with everything outlined to the finite detail. They just need to be consistent with the basics. And quite honestly, that's all I'm doing. I'm just consistent with the basics day in, day out, and just making that little bits of progress over the long term. Like, I don't overthink it. And honestly, when you don't overthink it, and you just focus on doing the basics, it takes the stress out of it, and it makes it so much easier. Right? I mean, it's it's, it's like a burden lifted off your shoulders when you don't have to, you know, nitpick. Like, I'll give you an example. I was talking to someone at the gym today. And uh, this person's, you know, hired a a nutrition coach to help them follow a fat loss program. And they were getting stressed out over their diet because their coach had chicken breast, like whatever it was, let's just say it was four ounces of chicken breast in with their meal plan. And they accidentally got chicken thighs and they're like, Oh my God, I have to recalculate all my macros now because I have boneless, skinless chicken thighs instead of boneless, skinless chicken breast. Like who gives a shit? Like, seriously, it's such a small detail. Like, that uh, that's not going to make a, a big difference either way. Like if you're eating chicken thighs or chicken breasts, like, I mean, okay, there might be a little bit more fat in the, in the dark meat than there is in the white, but that's not what's going to make or break your, your progress. Like skipping a workout and then going to McDonald's, that's what's going to make or break your, your progress. Not whether you have chicken breast or chicken thighs or not whether you're doing six reps or 10 reps or whether you're, you break your workouts in the, push pull legs or you have upper lower bodies like that, that, that's getting caught up in the weeds like you need to think of the bigger picture and focus on just consistency over the long term again 
once you have that in place, then you can start nitpicking on the details. But if you don't have that in place, then the details really don't matter. And, and that's that goes for so many people, right? Like you can build a, a very impressive physique, lean, have defined abdominal definition, look muscular. I mean, have a nice athletic beach bod and not worry about the details. Like as long as you're just consistent with the basics. Now, again, if you'd like some help with that, you know, like planning out a, an ideal program for you and your situation, shoot me an email. Like my email is leeh at leehayward.com. And if you have any specific questions about it, I'll be more than happy to, to chat with you and help you brainstorm a, a realistic action plan that's right for you. All right. We have Andrew joining in from Dublin, Armani from Manchester in the UK, uh, Anthony from the UK. Fred from Germany, Bren from Texas, First Revenge from California, Nathan from Canada. Where to in Canada, my friend? I'm in Newfoundland, East Coast. Uh, Demi's joining in from Houston, Texas. We got an international audience. A lot of folks from over in Europe. That's, that's cool to see. Uh, Jay joining in from Ontario. Uh, John coming in from New York City. Awesome. Charles from Charleston, South Carolina. And he's got a question saying, what is your view on more is less and less is more when doing mass building exercises? Um, what more is less and less is more. I guess it kind of relates back to what I was just talking about. Like, don't get caught up with the, the nitpicky details. Focus on the basics and the basics consistently. I think that's what you probably mean. Like, one of the biggest drawbacks that I see, and when I like, I'm watching YouTube videos, I'm following, you know, what's on the go, just like anybody else would be. And I constantly like, I'm shaking my head, like, I'm looking at some of the programs and some of the videos that people are putting out there, and like, they're so anal with details, like, about how many sets they have to do and how many reps they have to do, and you know, oh how many days per week do I have to hit each muscle group? And like, Oh, if I only hit each muscle group twice a week, is that not good enough? And like consistency with the basics over the long term is going to make the biggest impact in your results, not stressing over the details. And one of the drawbacks is when you try and make a program too complicated, too detailed, too rigid is it, it makes it harder to follow. And if it's harder to follow, you're less likely to follow it consistently. Like if you have a simple, easy plan that you are, are you're not overwhelmed with, like it's it's simple, but you can do it consistently. That is going to be ten times better than having the most complicated plan that you follow inconsistently. So I'm always a big fan of, of just sticking to the basics, mastering the basics. Like I, I've seen a lot of advanced athletes a lot of you know professional uh, i mean like bodybuilders and powerlifters and stuff and national level competitors and like some of the guys who like when you look at them you're like holy crap like dude like you're in shape and then you actually start talking to them about their program talking to them about their nutrition it's not as complicated as you think it is like more often than not these guys are not doing some crazy weird wacky exercises or some weird wacky set rep combination and and stressing out over all the nitpicky details they are just masters of the basics and they're mastering the basics day in day out week in week out year in year out like that's what builds results it's not you know stressing out over nitpicky details that in the greater scheme of things don't matter because like you'll see all the, the the science guys and i mean i'm a, I'm a fan of science don't get me wrong like i i science does have its place but application and making it fit within a your your actual schedule and lifestyle is is much better right i mean like again you could have the the scientifically best program but if you can't stick to it consistently it doesn't matter Right. I would rather you have the most basic, simple, total body workout three days a week and, and follow that. And you probably make better results than having the most advanced set rep hypertrophy structured program and just getting lost in the details. Right. Again, consistency over over intensity and over complexity every time. OK, who else we got here? Logical order is tuned in. He says, Lee, I got a question. 
says, someone at the gym told me protein shakes only count when you take them after a workout because that's when your muscles absorb the protein. Can I still supplement other times? Oh, my God. There's nothing magical about a protein shake. Protein is protein, and it works regardless of when you take it. And mean, what I mean by work is it just provides protein for your body. Protein is the raw material your body needs to build and new tissue, build and recover. So like your muscle tissue, if you break it down, like the dry weight of muscle is primarily protein. You break that down further, it's amino acids. Like it's protein is the building blocks. And it doesn't matter if you're getting it from a shake, if you're getting it from a chicken breast, if you're getting it from an egg, if you're getting it from the, some other protein food, protein is protein, right? And the, what matters the most is that you're eating it consistently and that you're getting enough. The general rule of thumb that you'll hear within the fitness industry is one gram of protein per pound of lean body mass per day. And that's a darn good place to start. If, if you're eating at least that much spaced out over the course of the day, you're going to be on the right track. And so whoever told you that a protein shake only works after a workout doesn't really know what they're talking about because again, you can eat protein or drink protein morning, noon or night, and it's still going to do the same thing. Again, think of protein shakes as just a quick and convenient source of protein food, right? Like there's nothing better over a shake than over a chicken breast or over a piece of steak or over a piece of fish. Like it's, it's, it's protein. That's all it is. It's just another source of protein. That's all you want to think of it as. The nice thing about shakes is they're quick, they're convenient, and they add a lot of variety to your nutrition because you can make some very tasty recipes with protein. And if you want, I actually have a recipe guide that you can download. I'll put a link to it in the video description of this. Um, and oh, for the heck, but I'll put it in the video chat there now if you want to go download it. It's my free high protein recipe guide. And these are recipes that use protein powder and you can make some very tasty meals. Uh, some examples are high protein pancakes, high protein muffins, high protein cupcakes, high protein oatmeal, high protein ice cream, high protein pudding. Like you can make these things using protein powder. So you can make healthier versions of some of the typical high carb junk foods that you're probably eating, like ice cream. Like if you eat real store-bought ice cream, it's it's just garbage, empty calories. It's just sugar and fat, right? There's no nutritional value or very little. But the recipe that I just posted a link to in the chat window, if you want to go scroll down and check it out, and if you're catching this via the replay, I'll have it in the video description. That allows you to make high protein, healthy ice cream that's actually going to fuel your muscle building goals and aid with fat loss. So like you can make healthier options using protein powder. So like I rarely drink a protein shake, but I consume protein powder in some of these recipes. Like I'll like to make high protein oatmeal. So, and, and that uses protein powder. Again, I use protein in my pancakes, protein in my uh, oatmeal. So it's, it's just a way that you can sneak in extra protein in your diet and make it tasty and convenient. All right, Frederick is saying, Lee, what can you mix oatmeal with to get complete protein? <laughs> How ironic. I was just talking about high protein oatmeal, and this is this is Fred's question. What can you mix oatmeal with to get complete protein? I mean, what other carb source? Oatmeal is 13 grams per 100 grams. Uh, I'm from Denmark. Um, I personally, man, I, I do the, the high protein oatmeal that I just recommended, and I posted a link right in the Scroll down in the video chat there now and you'll see it. The link to the high protein recipe guide. You can mix it with that. I mean, that would make it a, a high protein oatmeal and that would then you give yourself a good source of complex carbohydrates and a good source of complete protein. All right, another question here. Mr. Retro Angels in Mr. Hayward, I want to ask you, is doing five sets of 12 overkill because a lot of people do three sets. But for me, I, I feel better when I do five sets. Does it matter? It really depends on your work capacity and your fitness level and what it is you're training for. If you are doing five sets and it's working for you, you're getting results, then keep doing five sets, right? Like it, it, all this stuff, all these different variables, they're individual. Like if you take someone who's brand new to working out and, and never trained before, I wouldn't have them do five sets of an exercise because it's, 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 it is overkill in that situation. But for an advanced lifter, you know, they can probably handle that extra volume. 
And of course, there's there's so many other variables in play, like how many exercises are you doing? What are you? What is it you're training for? Right? There, there's there's so many variables that come into play. But if, if if it's working for you, you're seeing results, you enjoy it, then do it. Uh, Jay is asking, Lee, are you going to train your son when he's older? Absolutely. I mean, I'm kind of in a way encouraging him now. <laughs> Like if I'm doing workouts down in our home gym in the basement, like very often he's down there with me. I mean, now of course he's not working out, but you know, he, he'll play around. Like one thing that I, he often does, like he might get the, um, like the, the, the bar attachments that you use for, for like cable attachment, like the, the tricep push down bar, for example, he'll, he'll take the little, the little flat bar and he'll start doing some curls or he might take it and they start pressing it over his head and he'll say like Harvey's strong and he start lifting the little bar over his head and I've got some rubber resistance bands and like he'll hold them and try and you know try and do some exercises with the rubber resistance bands and like try and mimic what what he sees daddy doing so yeah absolutely when he gets older and you know and I, I hope he takes on an interest in, in training like I'm not going to force it on him but I'm going to lead by example so I mean if he sees me working out on a regular basis chances are he's going to want to work out as well, right? K kids follow what you do. They don't necessarily do what you say, right? They, they, they learn more by watching and, and, and learning by example that way. So I'm definitely going to encourage them, but at the same time, I'm not going to try and force it on them. All right, let's see. We've got Shane joining in and Jonathan's joining in. Uh, Shane saying, you have a thick, sexy body. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> and Jonathan's joining in. He said, what's up, Lee? An idea for you. Uh, I don't know if you have it already, but I'm new to the inner circle and I have the app, but would be nice if the two were intertwined. Just some food for thought. The the inner circle and the, the app, there, there are some content that, that's on both. Right. Some of the workouts, some of the nutrition guides and whatever are, are you'll find on both the inner circle and the app. But the thing with the inner circle, that's the hub that makes the whole thing work is we have that um, the, the discussion forum, you know, the private members only discussion forum. And that's where people post their training logs, uh, post their workout journals, all that stuff. That's exclusive to the inner circle. You're not going to find that in the app. Uh, Anthony's joining in. And he says, I think a lot of people should not listen to music when they work out, when they first start and really keep their mind clear and focus on form. I, I, if it makes a difference. I, I guess it's kind of personal preference. I know some people like listening to music when they train. I personally don't. I don't listen to music. I, if you see me with my earbuds in working out, I'm not listening to music. I'm usually listening to either audiobooks or podcasts. <laughs> That's what I do. I, I, I use my workouts as education time. I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I love to read books, but I don't have as much time as I would like to just to sit down and read. So I'm a big fan of audiobooks. This is this is awesome. If you're if you don't have a subscription to Audible, I mean, you got to get one. But I love listening to audiobooks. So very often when I'm doing cardio, when I'm doing weight training, whatever, right? I'm listening to audiobooks or podcasts. That's usually what I listen to. Um, but again, if if somebody like I understand where he's coming from, he's saying like if you're trying to learn an exercise. You get that mind muscle connection. Yeah, it, it, it can make a difference. So you might want to just focus on on the basics first before you overwhelm yourself with too much. It's, it's almost like to give you an example. Like you think of someone who's learning to drive a car. Like you have a you know you're, you're teaching a, a a novice driver. I'd recommend having the radio off so that they can focus all their attention on the road and on their driving and have all their senses available so they're not distracted by listening to the radio and also trying to drive. But once you have the mechanics and you you know how to drive and you're no longer consciously thinking of, okay, like how much pressure do I have to apply to the brake, to the gas, to the clutch, changing the gears or whatever, and, and you just, like, that's just becomes driving and it's all done like subconsciously, then there's no harm in listening to music while you drive. But while you're learning, that can be a big distraction. So yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, the same thing applies with weight training. If someone's just learning how to weight train. It'd probably be better for them to just focus purely on what they're doing and not trying to get distracted with music as well. Uh, let's see what else we've got. Um, no SMO King is joining us. Uh, 
Who else? Mohammed is joining us. He says, Mr. Lee, what is your opinion about one meal a day for some days and how do you count macros in one meal a day? If you need 130 grams of protein in normal day, should you get 130 grams in one meal? I'm not a big fan of one meal a day. I'll just flat out say that right off the bat. Um, it can work from a calorie restriction point of view, but it's not optimal for a health, fitness, and muscle building point of view. So, Again, you're going to hear different points of view on that, but bottom line, if like whether you're following intermittent fasting or one meal a day or whatever, like nutrients, calories, macros, like all that stuff still counts. So you still have to get what you need in that one meal or if you're intermittent fasting within your feeding window. So like if, if you need 130 grams of protein then and you're eating one meal a day, then yeah, you're going to try and eat 130 grams of protein in a meal. And obviously that's not practical for a lot of people. I would much rather you have three meals a day, split it up, right? Rather than trying to slam it all back into one meal a day. Like you need to look at the bigger picture. It, it doesn't matter whether you're eating six meals a day, three meals a day, two meals a day, or one meal a day. What matters is what you actually eat. It's the long-term average, like over the course of the week, over the course of the month, over the course of the year. Like that's what matters. Like a lot of people get caught up in the weeds and they're just thinking of, of the, the details and they think, well, I'm going to follow intermittent fasting or I'm going to follow one meal a day. Like, first off, I have to ask, why do you even want to eat one meal a day? What's, what's your reason behind it? And then we'll figure out, and then maybe it is because you want to, you know, lose body fat. Well, why don't you just eat smaller meals right? <laughs> rather than just try to have one big, massive meal? I mean, first off, it's not good for your digestion. Right. I mean, like trying to slam back all that big meal and having your, you know, all that food in your belly. I mean, that's a lot of food. Right. Like you just like, let's say you're trying to get one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day and you weigh 200 pounds and you're trying to get 200 grams of protein in a single meal. I mean, yes, you could physically do it, especially if you're, you know, eating a lot of high protein foods and then washing it down with protein shake and everything else. But it's not practical. Like you'd be much better off to break it up over three or four meals throughout the day and have smaller, more manageable, easier to digest meals than trying to slam it all down into one big meal. I, I, I think the popularity of the whole one meal a day thing is, is primarily from a weight loss point of view. And it can work in that situation. It's, it's a kind of like a lazy man's diet because instead of like you, you could literally not, not even have any nutrition plan whatsoever and just eat one big meal a day. And more often than not, you would be in a calorie deficit if you only ate one meal a day, because you probably physically cannot consume enough food volume to be in a surplus in one feeding. So that's where it comes into play from a fat loss point of view. And I mean, when you look at it from that point of view, okay, yes. I mean, if, if that helps you to lose weight and you're really overweight, I mean, okay, it might work. But it's not optimal. I, I would much rather see someone eat regular meals throughout the day and make better food choices and learn how to optimize their nutrition rather than just simply trying to eat one big massive meal a day and and, and do it that way. So I'm I'm not a huge fan of it. So uh, what else we got? N O S M O King is joining us. He says, a new subscriber here, Lee, can you give me some advice on stopping sugar cravings? Is it just willpower uh, after a meal? I always crave sugar, cakes, chocolate, etc. cetera. Um, it's a little bit of both. To get the ball rolling, it is going to take some willpower on your part, but you need to change your habits because willpower is a very finite resource. Willpower is not going to last forever. If you just try and rely on willpower, Sooner or later, that willpower is going to run out and you're going to give in to the cravings. You have to learn how to make better food choices. And you can do that with natural unprocessed foods. What you'll find is as you start to incorporate more natural unprocessed foods in your diet, you'll naturally turn, like, have less desire to eat the processed stuff. So my number one suggestion for someone who's trying to improve their eating, instead of thinking about what you have to cut out, Think about what you have to add. So prime example, like every single meal, fill up on lean protein and vegetables. That's my two go-to, like every meal, no matter what. 
right? Protein, veggies, protein, veggies. That's I make sure to fill up on that. And I eat a lot of volume when it comes to protein and veggies. Like uh, a typical meal for me, a big garden salad, right? I'll get a great big, you know, bowl, like maybe like a cake mixing bowl or, or some big serving bowl. And I'll eat the whole thing myself. Like I will fill that up with, like when I get these pre-made bags of salad from the grocery store or whatever, like I'll literally, depending on the size of the bag, if it's a small bag, I'll dump the whole thing in and I'll eat the whole bag of salad myself. It's one of these jumbo bags that you get at Costco. I might eat half of it, but I will eat a ginormous salad. Like normally what you would divvy up between like three or four people at the dinner table is these little tiny, you know, side salads that you get, like, which is like ridiculous. I would eat that whole thing myself. So fill up on the veggies, and then I would fill up on protein, whether that's chicken, meat, fish, eggs, turkey, wh whatever whatever your protein source is, fill up on that first. And that will pre-fill your belly. That will give you a lot of eating volume and a lot of eating satisfaction. And then you naturally have less room to eat the junk food afterwards. So that's, that's a habit. If you can start implementing that, that'll go a long way. Another one that's really good for sugar cravings is swapping out the sweets for fruit or for berries. Like I'm a, after I have a meal, like if, I, if I'm still craving something sweet, I'll very often have a piece of fruit or I'll have some, some berries. Like one that I like to do a lot is I will mix, I'll just get some like uh, frozen berries and I'll mix it up with some fat-free Greek yogurt. And that's a, like a great dessert. I mean, the, the Greek yogurt helps to bump up the protein, frozen berries. I mean, I'll let them thaw out a little bit so they're you know, eatable, but I, I like the, the cold texture of the berries and the yogurt and you mix that all together. And that gives me like a, a, a sweet dessert that I will enjoy. And again, very high in nutrients and very, I mean, yes, there are some sugar in the berries, but it's not the same as like cake or, or sweets because you're getting the fiber and the nutrients and the, the antioxidants in the berries. So, I mean, you're getting some nutritional value along with it. Uh, another one that I like to have as well is my high protein ice cream recipe, which is included in that recipe guide that I posted the link to in the chat window. You can go download that. That's a great one for satisfying cravings. Uh, high protein pudding. Like for me, I use protein powder as my alternative to get my sweet tooth fix. Because I mean, like a lot of protein powders, especially you get a nice, good, high quality whey protein, it tastes good. Like you get a nice chocolate flavor or maybe a a cookies and cream flavor or a vanilla flavor or whatever. I mean, mix that up. I mean, that, that'll get rid of the sweet cravings. Like I don't eat chocolates because I, I can have a chocolate protein powder and make something with it. So, I mean, that satisfies my chocolate craving. And, you know, as far as ice cream, like I eat ice cream every day, but it's high protein ice cream, which is made with uh, uh, liquid egg whites, uh, protein powder and frozen berries. So, I mean, all very high nutrient food, but when I mix it up, it tastes like ice cream. It has that sweet taste and the texture, and it gives me the satisfaction of eating a big, massive bowl of ice cream, but I'm getting pure protein and nutrients. So it's just making better choices. And when you eat like this, it doesn't take willpower because I still get the eating satisfaction. Like I eat a lot of food. And I was just having a conversation with some of my coaching students. They're people who just signed up recently. Like I sent them a sample diet plan to follow. And with all the different food options, like stuff that I'm sharing with you here, like some of the guys say, like, I physically can't eat all the food you have on, on the, the meal plan. Like I might have them set up on a 2,500 calorie a day meal plan. And they're like, I can't eat it all. And I'm thinking, well, like if you're eating the junk food and the crap that you were before, you're probably eating 3,000 calories or more and it's less volume. So they're eating higher volume food, higher nutrient food, and it's filling them up. So like they're getting stuffed on 2,000 calories a day, whereas if they were eating the processed junk food, they're probably over 3,000 calories and not getting nearly the nutritional value and still feeling hungry. So if you make these better food choices, you actually get more eating satisfaction, control the cravings, and enjoy the process. And, and that's what I focus on when I'm helping people with the you know customized meal plans and, and coaching them. It's It doesn't take willpower. It just takes better choices, better habits. And learning how to do this consistently and making it a part of your lifestyle. And I mean, that's what I've been doing myself. And it's it's a really cool system when you don't feel hungry. You actually feel full and satisfied. And of course, the foods that you're eating are nutrient dense so that you get energy and you feel good versus feeling sluggish and bloated and you know low energy and lethargic. Right. Like 
I, I enjoy the way that I eat and that's why it's a lifestyle. That's why I've been able to keep it up now, you know, and make, maintain it as a lifestyle, not just some, you know, short term fad diet that you follow for a few weeks until you run out of willpower and then you quit and go back to your old habits and binge and gain all the weight back again. Like this whole yo-yo dieting crap, like that doesn't serve anybody. I mean, you're better off not even going on a diet <laughs> than you are to go on a yo-yo diet. <laughs> at, least, at least you save yourself the stress and hassle. But anyway, if you would like some help with this, because I know there, there's so much detail with it, like I'm, I'm throwing out some tips and suggestions and I hope you benefit from it. But like, if, if you really would like some help with like taking all this stuff and mapping it out into like a step-by-step -step action plan that you can actually implement, send me an email and I'd be more than happy to discuss this. Like we can talk about you, your situation, what it is that you're trying to achieve in terms of building muscle, losing fat, getting in shape and you know, your schedule. Like we, we can discuss how we can take all this stuff and actually have the program fit for you and your schedule versus trying to get some generic cookie cutter program and making your life fit around the plan. I like to do the opposite. I like to have the plan fit around your life. So that way it's easier to follow, right? Reduce the friction, reduce the friction of you actually following through and making this happen. So again, if you'd like some help, send me an email, leeh at leehayward.com and we can have a chat. All right, I'm gonna have a sip of water and we'll move on and answer another question. Holy smokes, we've been going for 56 minutes. Man, where does the time go? I, like, I love doing these video chats. I really do. And I mean, when I, like, the time just flies. Like, shit, it feels like I just started and we're almost an hour in already. Shanto is joining and he says, I really hate to eat vegetables, but I like to eat. I got I to read that one again. I really hate to eat vegetables, but I like to eat lots of vegetables. Okay. Can I replace vegetables with greens powder? What are the main things need to look into when buying a greens powder? All right, first of all, I, I don't really understand your question because you're saying two completely opposite things. You say, I hate to eat vegetables, but I like to eat vegetables. Unless you mean you hate to eat them, but you want to eat more. Maybe that's what you mean. And then you're wondering about replacing vegetables with greens. All right. Greens is basically a supplement for your vegetable intake, just the same as like protein powder is a supplement for your protein intake. Like ideally, you'd be better off eating the whole food, but a supplement is like the next best thing. So the way I look at greens, it's just look at it exactly like that. Like visualize it as a supplement for your vegetables, just like protein powder is a supplement for your protein. I use both. I mean, I, I have greens powder, I have protein powder. And I will add them into my meal plan as needed. So, for example, if I don't get a lot of vegetables with a particular meal, then I'll supplement with the greens powder to make up for it. You know, like I'll give you an example. Like, let's say for breakfast, you're, you're in a hurry, you want to get out the door, and you don't have time to uh, have a big meal or have vegetables. That's a great time to slam down a greens shake. I mean, in fact, you could even make up a blender smoothie and put greens powder in with the smoothie and protein powder. So you're getting your veggies and you're getting your protein and you mix it all up. You know, if you want to throw in some fruit with it or whatever, and have like a, a, a liquid meal with all the, you know, the nutrients that you need, you could do that. Like that's a great way to get some extra you know, nutritional value in your meal plan. Um, so greens have their place. And the way I use it again, if I don't get enough vegetables with a meal, I will supplement with greens powder. Just the same as if I don't get enough protein with a meal, I'll supplement with a protein powder. Uh, what are the main things to look for with a greens powder? Um, I, I tell you one of the the, the the top quality greens powder that you can get is Athletic Greens. And I'll, I'll just post a link to it in our video chat window there if you want to go check it out. This is kind of one that you can use. I mean, you can order Athletic Greens if you want, or you can use it like as a, a benchmark to compare other greens supplements that you're going to get. Ah, shit, how do I say this? Um, did I get it? Let me see. I think I did. <laughs> no, I didn't. Hang on, guys. I'm getting the link there for you. Uh, okay. Gotcha. Okay, I'm going to type the link into the chat window there. It's athleticgreenspowder.com. You can go check that out. So the link is in the video chat. 
window right there now for those of you who are tuning in live. If you're catching this via the replay, I'll have the link in the video description afterwards. But you can check that out. That's a really high quality greens powder. Uh, that's the one I would recommend. And if you are going to get another brand, then you can kind of like compare the nutritional labels to use that as kind of like your, your benchmark of, of a good greens powder to go by. Uh, let's see what else. Um, but let's see. All right, we're just scrolling through some questions here. Let's see. Uh, that was shit. I lost my place. Uh, we were talking about greens. I scrolled down to type in the link there in the video chat, and I lost my place. Just a second, guys. All right, that was Shane's question, or no, sorry, Shanto's question. Um, okay, we have Farad is joining us. I believe he's from Thailand. How's it going, my friend? He, he recently followed through with the Lose Your Gut Challenge that we had earlier this month. Uh, he's got a question. He says, Coach, I can't sleep more than five to six hours per night, but when I wake up, I'm fresh. What do you think? <sighs> If you're getting a good quality five to six hours of sleep per night and restful sleep, that's the main thing, right? I mean, but ideally, I would try to get more sleep. I mean, like, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is like strive for eight hours, but it, it's kind of individual. Like, I've talked to a lot of people about this. Some people need a lot of sleep. Some people don't need as much. So it's kind of, there's an individual thing there. Uh, one thing I would probably recommend if you're not getting enough sleep in the night is if you can squeeze in a nap in the afternoon, that will make up a big difference, right? That's something that I, I very often do myself. Like if, if I don't sleep well or, or don't get a long night's sleep, I will sometimes make up for it with the nap in the afternoon if my schedule allows. And I find that that helps to just recharge my batteries and give me a little energy boost. And I find it quite helpful. But the main thing is how you feel and how you perform. Like if, if you feel rested and energized, I mean, you're getting six good hours of sleep per night. I mean, so some people can function fine on, on six hours of good quality sleep. I think it's the quality of sleep is more important than the length of sleep. Like if you get eight or nine hours, but you're tossing and turning and you're waking up and going to the bathroom two or three times throughout the night and, and all that kind of stuff, then no, that's not good quality sleep. But if you get a good solid six hours of restful sleep, you know, and that's more powerful and more beneficial than, you know, eight hours of unrestful sleep. So again, it's the quality over the quantity is the biggest thing you want to focus on there. Okay. Armani saying, thanks for answering my question. Really appreciate it. You are welcome, my friend. Uh, Carl saying, does squatting, benching, and deadlifting really increase testosterone temporarily and can it build muscle everywhere? All right. Working out in general helps to optimize your testosterone levels. Like, yes, the big exercises, the squats, the bench presses, the deadlifts, they do have a higher level of neuromuscular activation when you do them because it's they're such big demanding exercises. But as far as spiking your testosterone levels, like it, it has a, a, a slight benefit, but it, it's not major. Seriously, like the... the if, if you were to like measure the amount of testosterone increase, like of, of someone doing a workout with squats, benches, and deadlifts, and someone doing a workout without squats, benches, and deadlifts, like it's going to be minuscule at most. But those are good exercises for building mass, simply because you're 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 working so much muscle. Because like you think of a squat, like it's not just the legs that are getting involved. Like you, you, a squat is. Obviously, you're working your quadriceps, you're working your hamstrings, you're working your hips, you're working your inner and outer thighs, you're working your core, your spinal erectors, your obliques, your your traps, your your like your whole body comes into play. When you're doing a bench press, like it's not just the chest, right? It's the chest, the shoulders, the triceps, and all the stabilization muscles throughout your upper body that come into play. When you're doing a deadlift, I mean, basically the exact same muscles that come into play with squatting, and plus you're also getting a lot more. A trap and arm activation in there as well. So these muscles build muscle, or sorry, these exercises build muscle everywhere because virtually every muscle comes into play when you squat, bench, and deadlift, right? I mean, like if that, that's all you did, squat, bench, and deadlift, you, you would still develop all the major muscle groups of your body. And I've actually gone through training phases in the past where I've just primarily focused on squat, bench, and deadlift. 
I mean, there's a lot of powerlifting programs that just prioritize those three exercises and guys get big and, and strong all over. So they're definitely good fundamental exercises and they can help you to build muscle, but it, there's, you can build muscle with other exercises. Like I'm not saying that they're must do exercises, but if, if you have the ability to do them and you know, they don't cause you any mobility issues or whatever, uh, then by all means use them. But I know for a lot of guys, especially as you get older, sometimes they can't squat heavy or they can't deadlift heavy. Or if you have some shoulder issues, you might even not be able to bench press. So in those situations where you can't do those exercises, then we can you know, incorporate different exercises to work the same muscle groups. What I recommend people to focus on is training the muscle, not getting hung up on the exercise, right? There, there's a lot of different exercises you can do to train your body. You don't have to get hung up on certain exercises. Like, you know, just using some practical examples, like I, I focus on helping a lot of guys over 40. Like that's my main, you know, when you look at my coaching students, like that's the main demographic. I would say 90% of the guys that I coach now are, are men over 40. And sometimes they got issues. I mean, like age just beats you up. So they might have bad knees and they say, man, I can't squat or they got bad hips or they got lower back issues, or maybe they got some shoulder issues. So, I mean, a lot of these, you know, the squats, benches, and deadlifts might be out of the question for some of these guys. So then we're, we'll structure their program and work around different exercises instead. You know, don't get hung up on the exercise, focus on training the muscle. And fortunately, we have so many exercises available. I mean, you go to like most commercial gyms, you have dozens of different exercises that you can do for each body part. So you're not limited to just those few basic barbell lifts, right? You can still get a good training session in and build a good physique, even if you can't squat, bench, or deadlift. And speaking of my coaching students, we have Rick joining in. He's one of our new coaching students. He actually went through the Lose Your Gut Challenge and now part of the VIP coaching group. Welcome, Rick. Glad to have you tuning in. And we have John joining us from Virginia. Uh, another question here. This one's from Yesina. I think it's Yesina. If I'm mispronouncing your name, I do apologize. But her question is, Lee, I'm mid forties, overweight, 200 pounds, five foot six. I feel so tired and heavy to work out, but I have a treadmill. How long do you advise to start on it? Keep it simple. 10 minutes, literally like don't, don't make it any more complicated than that. Like if you're just starting out and you've, and you feel that it's overwhelming to start working out and you just want to start small, like literally 10 minutes, go for 10 minute walks, 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. Start with that. Like for your first week of exercise, 10 minutes of, of walking. I mean, it could be treadmill or it could be outside. It does, it doesn't really matter. Like this time of year, I mean, it's, it's when winter's coming on, probably snow on the ground, depending on where you live, of course. I mean, if it's not fit to get outside for, for a walk, then the treadmill is a great alternative, right? But if, if possible, I like to get outside. I just like the fresh air and the outdoors whenever possible. But use whatever tools you have available. Like in my case, I have an elliptical machine in my basement. And if the weather's not suitable outside, I will use that. But keep it small. Just 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the evening. Don't make it any more complicated than that. Do that for the next couple of weeks. And I guarantee you, you will feel better, right? That will just be enough to build the momentum. And what's going to happen is, let's just say after a week or two of doing these little 10-minute walks on the treadmill, you're going to feel better. And you're probably going to be able to walk faster, walk at a higher incline, walk longer. Like your intensity and work capacity and all that will naturally improve once you get the habit in place. So don't, we need to focus on the basics. Like the hardest part of exercise is starting. The hardest part of going to the gym is showing up to the gym. Like what you do once you're there, that's the easy stuff. The hardest part is to get off your ass and get to the gym. <laughs> the hardest part of using your treadmill at home is getting off your butt and getting on the treadmill. So just make it a habit to do that. Like even if you're walking for five minutes, I mean, do that. Like don't make it complicated. Just focus on the habit. Heck, even if you have to walk for 60 seconds, I would rather you do that and do 60 seconds in the morning and 60 seconds in the evening and just build the habit, build the habit of consistency. And then once you have the habit in place where you're doing it, you're actually getting off your butt and getting on the treadmill, you can always walk a little faster. You can always walk a little longer or walk at a higher incline. You can always make it more challenging, but focus on the habit. The habit is the hardest thing to build, right? I mean, I 
that, that applies to everybody. Like for those of you who are struggling, you're like, oh, I, I find it hard to get to the gym. I find it hard to work out. I find it just focus on getting there. Don't get overwhelmed with what you've got to do once you're there. Just focus on actually showing up. Showing up is the hardest part. And once you master that, the rest is easy. All right, let's see. Um, where else? So that was um, to okay, logical orders joining in. Uh, Ralph is joining in. Uh, what else? Another question here from uh, Jesus Vale says, what's your thoughts on eating beef rare as opposed to cooking it very well done? Are more nutrients kept in the rare versus and rare less cooked meat? It's, I mean, obviously you want to cook it to, to the point where it's cooked and, and, you know, I wouldn't recommend eating raw meat or anything like that. But if, if you want to eat your meat rare or medium or whatever, I mean, that's fine. I mean, obviously if, if you burn it up, then you're going to destroy more of the nutrients in the cooking process. That's kind of applies to everything. I mean, if the more you cook it, you're going to lose a bit of the nutritional value. So yeah, I, I would recommend rare to medium for the steak. Like I, I personally don't like a, a well done steak. I mean, if a steak is well done, then it, it's, it's burnt. <laughs> I, I like a little bit pink in the middle, right? I like it, you know, well cooked on the outside, obviously, but I want it pink in the middle. So I mean, that that's the way I like it, and I guess that would be considered medium. But if you if you fancy rare, then that's fine as well. I mean, bottom line, you want to focus on on the quality of the foods. Like th this is kind of nitpicky details. Like the fact that you're eating like foods like meat and vegetables and good complex carbohydrates. Like that's the most important thing. How you cook them? Well, I'm not saying that it's not important, but that's secondary in importance to the foods that you're actually eating. Uh, Blue Leaf is joining us and he says, how much fiber would you recommend uh, for daily overall health? Fiber, I, I personally don't measure my fiber intake and I don't take any fiber supplements either. But what I do, I, I eat a lot of natural unprocessed foods, vegetables, fruit, uh, you know, foods that have natural fiber in there like oatmeal and potatoes, uh, you know, sweet potatoes, things of that nature, beans, legumes. All those foods have, have high fiber. So I'm getting a lot of fiber through my diet just through the natural unprocessed foods that I eat. I don't like supplements with fiber supplements. And in fact, I'm not a fan of fiber supplements because I find that they can sometimes have the opposite effect of what you're looking for. You're much better off eating real fiber through real foods because it, the way the body processes it and utilizes it, it actually is more efficient than having a concentrated fiber supplement. Right. I've actually seen people sometimes get constipated taking fiber supplements because it can actually bind you up inside because it doesn't process and digest and pass through as easily as real fiber in natural unprocessed foods. So as long as if, if you're following like the general guidelines that I recommend, like having vegetables with every meal, then you're, you're going to cover your fiber intake. Right. You don't need to worry about adding extra fiber or counting the grams or whatever. Just Make sure that you're eating you know, natural unprocessed foods throughout the day and you'll have your fiber intake covered. All right, let's see what else we've got. Uh, Roshan is joining us and he's asking, what do you think of canned food and ready frozen meals? Uh, it has its place. I mean, obviously, if, if you can have nice fresh food like fresh fruits and fresh vegetables and all that i mean that would be ideal but i mean frozen is is great like i i'm a big fan of, like i buy big bags of frozen berries i big buy big bags of frozen vegetables you know the thing about frozen is it's when it, it's picked when it's supposed to be picked so it's picked when the food is ripe and then it's frozen very quickly so it maintains the nutritional value of fresh so i mean fro frozen is really good i'm a big fan of of uh, frozen veggies and frozen berries and things like that. Uh, canned, it can still be a, a suitable substitute. I mean, it, it's it's quick and convenient. Uh, I mean, I, I will have canned foods on hand sometimes for the convenience factor more than anything. Like if, if I'm in a jam and I don't have time to, uh, you know, cook up some food, I'm like, 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 for example, if I don't have time to cook up a chicken breast or a steak or something like that, I'm going to crack open a can of tuna fish and have that as like a, a source of protein. I mean, 
I, I wouldn't recommend relying on it, but like having it in addition to a good overall diet, it's it's certainly a you know better than going for the the um, the sorry the processed junk foods. Like you'd be much better off having a, like a can tuna fish or canned vegetables or something like that versus you know like a, a slice of pizza or, or like french fries or burger or junk food or whatever so fresh or frozen ideally canned you know you can use it in moderation um, i mean I, I personally do i'll tell you one thing that i i do have sometimes and i find that it's a great filler and it adds a lot of variety to my eating is sometimes i'll have like canned soups like uh and you got to read the nutritional labels when it comes to this, but like like a lentil soup or or something along those lines, it can sometimes add a lot of flavor to food or sometimes like even a tomato soup or something like that. Like if I'm cooking up meat uh, or something, I'll probably pour in a can of, of soup with it to add some variety. Like if you know, chop up some chicken breast, throw in some vegetables, throw in a can of lentil soup with it and like stir it all up in the pot. And it actually makes a nice tasty meal and you get some extra, you know, nutrients that way so uh, th i'll use that from from time to time as well to add some variety to my meals uh how are we doing um hour and 15 minutes in all right i'm going to answer another question then we're going to clue it up guys let's just see i'm going to scroll through i mean i appreciate all the the comments and support we're getting a lot of positive feedback coming through here uh let's see um, uh, All right, Alexis is joining in, says, I've been watching your video since 2011, uh, made gains, I learned a lot from you, thanks. It's been six years uh, since I've worked out and I've gained 100 pounds, having trouble getting back. Do you have any advice? This is 245 pounds as of now. Send me an email and let's chat. So again, leeh at leehayward.com and we can plan out a realistic action plan for how you can lose that weight that you've gained over the past six years. Uh, I think I skipped one there. Uh, this is from Roland. Said, "How do you get out of a, a slump of a loss?" <laughs> Let me have a drink of water. <laughs> How do you get out of a slump? He says he's lost his motivation. <sighs> that could be a long question. Um, <laughs> the big thing I, I, I'll, I'll end with this. That's actually a good question to end this whole video chat on. So again, I'm, I'm going to clue it up after this one. Um, when it comes to motivation, you really have to dig deep and think of why do you want to lose weight, build muscle, get back in shape, whatever it is that you're looking for, right? And it has to be bigger than the superficial goals of, oh, I'd like to look better or, oh, I, I'd like to lose 10 pounds before holiday or whatever. Like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with those goals, like looking better or, you know, something like that. But it, it has to be something bigger. You have to have something bigger that's driving you. And very often it has to be something bigger than yourself. And, and I'll give you an example. In, in my case, like back when I was competing in bodybuilding, my main motivation well, actually, let me even backtrack. Let's, let's, I'll just share my whole story of how I got involved with fitness right from the start. When I was going to grade school, right, you know, I got the shit kicked out of me by the bullies, right? The bigger kids would, would pick on me and bully me and, you know, beat me up in the schoolyard and all that. So my motivation started with I wanted to get bigger and stronger so that the bullies wouldn't pick on me. So I actually started with martial arts. That's what I got involved with first. Uh, that led to weight training. Uh, and then once I got involved with weight training, then I, I became introduced to uh, powerlifting and bodybuilding, and that really sparked, sparked my interest. And then I got involved with the sport, right? So then it became a competitive aspect. So now I was an athlete competing, and my goal was to improve in competition. And then for years, that was my main motivation. I just wanted to, to do better than I did the year before. I wanted to win a competition. That was my main driving force, right? I wanted to become Mr. Newfoundland and Labrador. That was my main driving force for, for years. And and I had a, I was very determined because I lost a lot of shows. It took me 10 competitions before I won my very first show. 10 competitions over the course of 12 years. Because the way it was, uh, well, the way it is with our, our local federation, we only have one show a year because Newfoundland is a fairly small province population-wise. So we only have one competition a year. 
So it took me 10 competitions over the span of 12 years before I finally won a competition. So 12 years of competing, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, it, it took a long time. I mean, that, I started competing when I was uh, 17 years old, right? So, I mean, by the time I was 29, I finally won a show, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's not about like determination and consistency, right? I mean, that's, that's what it took. But that was my main driving force for a long time was just the competition aspect. Once I retired from competition. I mean, it's not like it's a career, but I mean, once I stopped competing in competition, which was in 2011, I went through a slump of motivation because now like my motivation was always to get ready for the competition, you know, to do better and, and to improve my placing. Like that was my driving force for years. Once that was gone, then I was like, okay, I still like working out, but I don't really have the motivation to get in shape or stay in shape. And that's, that's when I had its slow decline. Right. So, I mean, if you look at my um, like, especially if you've been following my videos, like if you see my videos pre 2011, that's when I was, you know, competing regularly. So I would go through fluctuations of like off season bulking, pre contest cutting. So you might see some here. Here's Lee's fat off season video. Here's Lee's lean pre contest video. And I'd always be yo yoing up and down in those phases. But I was I always had the motivation of a competition luring over my head. Once that was gone, then it was just like a slow decline right? Because I didn't have anything to really drive me. And it really got, you know, at an all time low around like after my son was born, you know, and I really let myself go. Like I made poor choices when it comes to my nutrition and everything else. And then I just, I got fat and out of shape and lazy. And my main motivating factor now is I don't want my son to grow up with a fat out of shape dad. I, I don't want him to think that it's okay to be fat and out of shape and that that's normal. I want to be a real world role model for him. I want him to look up to me as his real world superhero. Right. And, and it's, it's cool because like we're, we're down now, like I'm working out in, in our home gym and sometimes he'll come down and he'll say, Oh, daddy's strong. Daddy's lifting heavy weights and stuff like that. I mean, he, he gets excited and he's only three years old and that's, I want to, you know, send that message to him. Now I want him to, to adopt the healthy lifestyle habits of exercise and nutrition and being active and looking after himself, like right from the get go. I don't want him to have these, these bad habits installed. And that's my main motivating factor. Like it's bigger than me. I'm not doing this for me anymore. I'm doing it because I want to set an example for him. So when you're in a motivational slump, you need to look at what can you do this for? What is it all about? It, and it usually has to be something bigger than you because We'll often do more for others than we'll do for ourselves. So if you can make working out, losing weight, getting in shape about something bigger than you, you're more likely to do it. Uh, I'll give you an example from some of my coaching students. Like a lot of guys who come to me, they're, you know, men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and, you know, they're, they're overweight. They've, they've, they've went through this phase of they've constantly been neglecting their health and fitness because they're, they're the man of the house. They're, they're focusing on their work. They're focusing on their family. They're focusing on others. They're focusing on, you know, the, the being the breadwinner and, and taking care of everybody else while their own health and fitness just gets pushed to the side. And I mean, at the end of the day, right, after a long day of work, after dealing with the family, you know, taking their kids to whatever events and practices that the kids got and all that, like there's no time left for them. So they're always getting the shitty end of the stick, right? They're always their health and fitness gets pushed to the side. So then over the course of several years, they're looking at themselves in the mirror and like, who's this fat slob looking back at me, right? Like, holy crap, I'm 50 pounds overweight. How did this happen? So they need to just turn their life around because they're heading down a very nasty road. Like if you are a man over 40 and you're overweight and out of shape, that's going to lead to diabetes. That's going to lead to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, you know, your risk of heart attack, stroke, cancer, diabetes, all these health issues become very real, right? I mean, I'm sure every single one of us, you know, know people who have died of any of these illnesses, you know, had diabetes, had died of a heart attack, right? Died of cancer, died of a stroke, whatever. I'm like, I, I can, I've got friends, family and relatives that I can just name off who died of all of these different illnesses. And it's sad to see someone who goes from, being the man of the house, the breadwinner, the provider to the family, to now becoming a burden on the family where they're so sick and that they can't work anymore. They become bedridden. 
and now the family has to tend on them. So they be, go from the man of the house, who everybody's depending on, to someone who's totally helpless, and now you're depending on your family to look after you. I mean, that's a nasty situation to be in. So think of your family. Like, do you want to die before your grandkids are born, right? Do you want to, you know, not have an uh, active lifestyle where you can actually participate and be around for, for your family and not have them tending on you as you get older? Like, how, how cool would it be to have strength and energy and, and athleticism as you retire and being able to play with your children and your grandchildren and, and not just be, you know, fat and out of shape and crippled and sitting in a rocking chair while your kids are playing and you can't do anything because you're so fat and out of shape or worse, you're bedridden or maybe you got type two diabetes and you have your leg amputated and now you can't even walk. Like that's the reality. That's, that's the world that people are going down and it's all due to poor health and lifestyle choices. So, I mean, if you can think bigger and think, Hey, I want to be the exception and actually have be a live a long, healthy, athletic lifestyle like you don't have to be a bodybuilder or anything like that, but just so you're not bedridden, right? So you can actually participate with your family and not have people tend on you, right? Like if, if you can do that, that's your motivation. Like whatever your situation is, you have to think of something and ultimately it has to be bigger than you. So with that being said, I'm going to shut up now and we'll pull up the video chat. <laughs> All right. What else? Oh, one more question there. Daniel saying, how can I get in touch with you for online coaching? Send me an email. Lee H at LeeHayward.com and we can chat. Simple as that. If you have any questions, send me an email. All right. Very easy. All right, guys. I know there's a ton of questions coming through here. All right. People saying great advice. Thanks. You're very welcome. All right. Masi saying, let's all give a thumbs up for, for our coach. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to clue it up again. As always, the replay of this will be posted up. Well, as soon as I finish the video chat, the replay is going to be posted up. But I'm going to get the timestamps for all the different questions covered. Get that posted up hopefully within over the weekend. So if you'd like to zoom back over and jump to any of these different questions, you can certainly do so. And next week, we'll be doing another one. So next Friday, same time, same place. Have yourself a great weekend. And I look forward to talking to you then. Take care. Over and out.